All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. It's Wednesday, October 16th, 2019. And this is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Call. Um, my name is Tricia Gordon. I'm the facilitator for today's call. And we're going to start with any announcements that folks may have. And Terry, um, thankfully, has posted the Etherpad um, link again. So please sign in if you haven't yet done it. Sorry, Wilma. Go ahead. I was just going to remind people to sign up for the virtual conference. <laughs> So um, yeah. we are still giving away swag, so we extended that a little bit. If you were worried that you wouldn't get a Sakaiger mug or something, um, you know, there's still time if you get your registration in soon. Um, so we, uh, we're we still giving away those things. And we're also, I haven't put out the, the notice yet. I'll probably go out later today. Um, we're going to be having a pet photo um, matching contest at the virtual conference this year. So you can submit a picture of your pet. And, um, and then uh, attendees will get a chance to match the pets with their owners and the people that get the most right win a prize. So um, we hope that'll be a fun activity and get to see lots of cute pictures. So, um, so hopefully you guys will take part in that and it should be a great event. Um, also, you probably saw the announcement last Friday, um, Sakai 19.3 was released on, on Friday. So that's uh, the latest maintenance branch and it's got a lot of updates, um, particularly in LTI and Turnitin. Um, there were a lot of fixes related to those two issues along with some other stuff. But um, so it's, it's a pretty big uh, maintenance release. So if you've not already um, gone to 19.3, you might want to think about when to apply that because um, you will pick up a lot of fixes in that release. So um, that's it for me, unless anybody else has announcements. And the has the pet photo contest announcement gone out yet? Wilma? Nope, I will send that later today. So it has um, details about what what we'd like you to include besides of in addition to your photo. So look for right. that. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Wilma. Anybody else have any announcements? Tiffany, stop it. <laughs> I'll text for the photo. <laughs> as long as it doesn't give away the owner. Yeah. Right. I'll text. <laughs> I put a link to the um, the contest page on the website. That's also got the information about the contest. So Tiffany, I am responsible for posting these um, the photo contest pages. So I will be sure to include alt text uh, for for what it's worth. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Um, <clears throat> we have a Jira review. Um, yep. And I'm not sure who submitted it. I, I actually did on behalf of um, the folks on the, oh, great. the core team call. And I believe Earl and Adrian are here. They might also want to um, chime in on this. This relates oh, to um, rubrics and should, how they should work when it uh, when it's a group submission assignment. So um, the group submission right now, it, it doesn't work very well at all with the rubric. And so the question is, should it just be a single rubric to, to mm -hmm. evaluate the, the group submission, which is a single item, or is there a need for people to override individual students? Because you can do a great override for individuals in the group. Um, do you need a rubric for that? And because that would be a little more complicated because it's it's the way it's uh, stored, it's tied to the submission, it's not tied to the group. So, um, but I'll let Adrian and, and Earl um, explain it a little bit more. Yeah, and it also looks like if you, you might need to expand all the comments to see Earl has posted three possible solutions in the first comment of that JIRA. So Earl, do you wanna walk us through those? or where we are now in terms of these options? Um, sure, <clears throat> sure. So um, yeah, looking at that comment, there's, um, it's just, this is just covers. Um, uh, well, before I say that, uh, I just would like to say that uh, rubrics um, really um, did was not built with groups in mind um, initially. 
And so um, the reason, obviously, that we're running into this problem is is because of that. Um, uh, you know, some of us have thought um, that, um, you know, until this is resolved, maybe it would have been best to, let's say, turn off the option to uh, allow the use of using rubrics for group-based um, submissions. Again, this is this is group-based submission, right? So mm -hmm. where the submission is for, there's one submission for a group not a not this does not cover submissions that are individual even if they are let's say um you know released to specific groups right even if it's released to specific groups it's still an individual submission so those you know those are um don't pertain to this right this is you know again group um a single submission per a group and so again Rubrics was never really designed with groups, groups, uh, with group support, basically. And there's a lot of tools in Sakai that, you know, don't have group support, right? So Rubrics isn't, this isn't like, you know, something, um, you know, uh, um, yeah. unknown, you know, or, or adverse or anything like that, right? There's a lot of tools no. that don't have group support. Except assignments does and, and Rubrics mm -hmm. is tied to that, so. Yeah, well, right. And group, right. I mean, it's, you know, it's tied to, you know, a bunch of tools. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, you know, we've hypothesized was, you know, maybe we turn off, you know, uh, using rubrics for group, you know, for these group based submissions. Right. Um, but anyway, um, in order to solve this problem, um, we, ha you know, we've kind of come up with three possibilities about how to solve this. Um, and one is to use like, so in the, in the post that I posted there, one is to use the group ID, uh, for example, as the owner ID. Um, and what this does is it ties the actual rubric to that group, right? Um, and it would mean that um, you wouldn't be allowed to have, um, for example, a rubric, uh, you know, an individual rubric per per user because it's you know it's 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 assigned to the group. It's not assigned to an individual user. Um, so that's like option one. Um, and then number two is where the uh, rubric or the I'm sorry the uh, the 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 rubric evaluation is assigned to the individual user. Now, what number two, number two is the most complicated because you have to create a, an evaluation that is common to everyone, right? Initially, right? Because it's, you know, it's uh, usually you grade the submission first and then you go and do overrides, you know, afterwards. And so you'd have to still have an ability to say, okay, this uh, rubric is given to the submission. And then we have these override rubrics, which are, let's say, given to each user different, you know. Um, and if the user doesn't have a rubric, then it's kind of like, oh, then go use the, the you know, the, the common, the, the rubric that was, uh, the rubric from the submission, which would be common to everyone. This is kind of complicated to do that. Um, it's, um, and then there's number three, which is probably the simplest, <laughs> the simplest, um, and in some, some ways it makes, um, um, it's a lot more sense in that the submission, um, the rubric is related to the actual submission. So what the, the rubric, the rating on the rubric is a rating for the submission. It's not tied to any single user, right? It's tied to the actual submission. Um, the good thing about something like that is if groups change, right? So um, not that, you know, in assignments we have things locked down right now, but um, with groups changing and stuff like that. But I think in the future we actually would, would like we have uh, Jira's open to like allow group changes and things like that, but but assignments needs to be better group aware in order to um, do that. But in so doing so, if it, if number three would also support that case uh, in the future about you know uh, if a uh, you know a submission so would so would option one actually you know because again um, three and one are sort of where the the uh, uh, in one, the uh, rubric is tied to the group, and then in three, it's not. It's actually tied to the actual submission itself. 
where number two is actually this it's uh um you know again the rubric is there would be a, a a generic rubric on the submission and then there would be an override rubric for each individual user the one last thing about this um assignments allows grade override right the grade override is unaffected by all this okay that is still always the case um it that's a feature of assignments it's not an it's not a rubric thing um that's a feature of assignments and uh, you'll always have the ability to do a grade override. So, for example, um, option three, you'd be able to, um, you know, grade using grade the submission using a rubric, and then you would still be able to, let's say, go in and put in the override for individual users, right? So, if the rubric graded out to be, let's say, an eighty, and you know, you can go in there and say, oh, I want to give this user a few more points, or I want to give that, or I want to subtract some points, whatever have you. You know, you'll always still be able to do that. So, so that's, that's the, uh, mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's the gist. Summary. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Earl. I think that's good. And there's been some comment commentary going on in the chat. Um, Tiffany started by saying she thinks it's important to have a rubric for a group submission. So I believe she is aligning with option number three there. Um, and also I'm seeing Michael Green has posted um, a pretty detailed comment as well in the JIRA um, about how it would be desirable for it to work. And he believes that your number three suggestion would accommodate all of those conditions. Is, do you think that is the case, Earl or Adrian? Yeah. Well, I'm reading it now. Okay. And do others have any thoughts? And you can chat or come on your mic. So just one comment and, and I don't, know if it's something that that could be implemented immediately it might be kind of a phase two kind of thing um, just in that I can see a use case where um, an instructor might have as part of their grading rubric the students participation <clears throat> in the assignment so that 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 may actually be built into the rubric um, so that in that case you would want to be able to grade individuals separately um I'm, I'm just throwing that out as a use case i'm not necessarily advocating that that's the route we should go at this point but i think it's something to keep in mind maybe as a final goal sometime in the future where you actually could i you i could envision it as either okay you can adjust the rubric for individual students after you've filled it out for the group? Or would there be some way to attach two separate rubrics to the same thing, one which goes to the group and one which is assigned individually? I'm just kind of talking out loud here. Um, as, just as possibilities. A workaround could be just creating a, an additional ass uh, assignment to do that. True. That, I mean, that would be a workaround, yeah. It definitely is a workaround, um, and, but, you know, or a phase two or three. But. Yeah. But I, I think the point of a group submission assignment is specifically to have a single grade or rubric in this case for the assignment submission. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if you really want to grade individually, in that case, you would want to create a grade book item for this assignment separate from the assignment itself. Uh, where you have a rubric attached to that, and then you grade each student individually on that rubric. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a more appropriate use of the individual grading rubric uh, that includes participation, just to attach it to its own separate Fair item. Um, but in the group submission, you specifically want to grade everyone at once. And so yep. there, I think having a single rubric for that submission makes sense. I agree with that part of it, yeah. I was just thinking about that one, that kind of use case, and 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 what the most efficient way to be for an instructor to grade that would be. 
um, again, just really just thinking out loud and, and maybe that's a, a future end goal as opposed to where we want to be right now. Yeah, I, I think Tiffany raises a great point about the uh, the possibility of having, let's say, right now, you know, as you know, like um, when you're grading things, it's a, it's a typically, you know, it's a one to one thing, right? It's like, you know, you've got one, you know, there's one grade item for that for that thing. I think what Tis Tiffany's uh, kind of um, thought there is that maybe in the future we have where there could be multiple grade items per let's say a single assignment or single you know uh unit of you know whatever it is that you're grading but there could be multiple um grade items not just a single one so that's that's a and i think that's you know that could be you know um that you know that could be even outside like you know this particular use case with rubrics fair enough that, yeah, that that actually would work if there was if you could associate two grade items and one mm -hmm. one would be the group and and one would be an right. individual. Again, I think that's a kind of a a future yeah. feature request not to be addressed at this point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Earl and Adrian, do you feel like you have enough to go on? To it sounds like the consensus is option three is is. The initial way to go yeah like the only other avenues that we've we've thought about this quite a bit the only other things that we were um thinking of was and people might um is uh might have you know be with you know again a future feature maybe in peer review where um because one of the things that rubrics does really well is you know organizing um you know kind of the constructs around the grading itself right and so um that is a really useful feature for peer review right um because it gives you know the peers the ability to see what they're what they should be grading on right and how they should be grading really um so um and that's also i would say a future feature potentially to yeah. say if you were going to use peer review how you know you know um and if you want to and if rubrics were allowed to be used in peer review um i'd like to see well. that yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. And we don't have time in today's session to continue <laughs> to go through all the possibilities, but um, I, we I, have enough. Yeah. I just want to make sure you guys have what you need to move forward for now. Yeah. If if okay. you don't mind, Trish, could could yeah. um, could you guys leave a just a quick comment maybe on the JIRA to, you know, I to. Oh, great. Appreciate that. Yeah. That's all I needed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Yeah, and everyone um, for chiming in. It's an important um, feature. So this is, this is great. All right. We are ready to move into our main um, topic, Lessons 2.0 Wireframes. And Wilma and Josh are going to lead us through that. So if, um, if some of you were at the Longsite clientele call last week, you've probably seen um, some, some of this. Uh, some of it was tweaked and, and we got some new images uh, just this morning. So you're seeing them mm -hmm. only minutes after we are. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but these are some very preliminary wireframes um, that were um, generated by a, a UX designer that we've contracted with to kind of try to give us a fresh perspective on what the UI might look like um, for Lessons 2.0. So we sort of gave him a lot of the stuff that had been gathered, the feedback and, and ideas that we had talked about over the last several months um, and, uh, and let him kind of design up something that uh, we could maybe uh, implement. So these are, again, very preliminary. Um, and I'm actually, Wilbur, be before you dive in, just to sort of put all this in context, okay. um, <laughs> I mean, we've been uh, so we're already looking in some ways toward the planning for Sakai 21. So the, you know, even you know the freeze date for 20 just happened, but but still, as as, as we look ahead, um, you know, we thought that we would, you know, now that we've gotten some of the the technology pieces in place, like web components and some other pieces to enable this. 
uh, getting th those have gotten into Sakai 20. Now we can start thinking about uh, what lessons 2.0 should look like. And these wireframes and this input is going to lead next to a project plan for implementation. So we're starting to lay the tracks in front of us. And this is a key step in all of this. Yeah. So we'd like to get as much feedback as possible on these designs um, early in the process so that we can make adjustments. Um, so this uh, screen is just sort of illustrating the ability to add a page layout or a template. Um, so you would have maybe a selection of different layouts that you could apply to a page. Um, and this page is um, a visualization of, of how you might um, reorder different pages within a lesson. And this page is the editing view um, where you've got kind of the, the WYSIWYG editor here. We also have the ability to, to bring in um, links and other resources from within the course. And you've got kind of a table of contents over here on the side that lets you jump around if you're navigating within the lesson. And then this last page was um, sort of a course map, I believe we were calling it, um, where you could actually see uh, various different lessons within a site. And um, and we had been talking last week about making this more of a flow chart, perhaps, where you could kind of see the interrelations between um, pages and maybe even enable the, the ability to, to view like conditional release criteria and, and things like that. We haven't quite fleshed that out, but that was some of the, the thinking um, that had been uh, discussed last week. And we took that um, info back to Ben, but he hasn't done anything with this mock-up since then. So dashboard up there will probably be renamed to something else. That'll probably take you back um, home, I would think. Uh, and then we would need to come up with a name <clears throat> for this sort of space where you can get to um, multiple lessons in a site or maybe uh, retrieve deleted items. So, and that's it. That's all we've got so far. So I'm interested to hear any comments that people have. If you want me to go back to a particular slide, happy to do that. Um, we, I love this look and feel. It looks beautiful. Um, so it uh, looks like Mike, Michael Green has a question about why separate this screen from the reorder screen shown earlier. Is there some way they could be combined? Yeah, sort of combining this with the other functionality. I had that same thought, actually. That they're both sort of navigational kinds of things. And Sean, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Michael. This is Michael. I was just going to say, if possible, if we can, like, not, if we can prevent our users from having to switch between a bunch of modes, I think that'd be awesome, mm -hmm. right? So if that, that was what I was thinking of that. It would be also very cool, speaking of the workflow idea, if you could, if one could sort of map how, you know, you want this page to load and then point, you know, drag something so that it connects to another page as the next page to load or, you know, just have some sort of UI for, for set, setting the workflow. And I don't know if that's part of the reorder work or probably is. This is Dave Evelyn. Do the differences of views provide some means by which um, it makes each of those potential functions more accessible by way of uh, faculty who need to have those accessibility things built in? Because I, I wonder about trying to pull all this sort of in a single screen. Uh, while I do agree with the fact that, you know, that's a lot of screens, I wonder about that providing functionality for those who need accessible uh, access to doing this kind of development work. Yeah, that was something I noted about the that last page. Um, it doesn't look like it would be very keyboard um, or screen reader friendly, uh, whereas the reorder page can behave like other reorder pages in Sakai that we currently have, where you have a UD key uh, control for reordering the things. 
up and down. Up down. Is that U D is slang for up and down? <laughs> yeah, the, no, it's the U and D key on the keyboard. Those are the actual keys used to move. Oh, up and oh. Down. okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, in, in the UI, that's the actual keyboard keys you use. Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So potentially, if we were to combine um, this this concept here with the reorder space, that would cut down on the number of screens. And um, if you make it more um, keyboard friendly, um, that would be another bonus. So we can definitely mm -hmm. take that feedback back to him. Yeah. Possibly a way to. Um to reorder with the arrow keys on the keyboard. So you would select a page in that, that last screen and then you know maybe arrow it right or left or up or down. Um, it's not clear to me from that last screen how exactly the, the organization flows. Um, is it you know left to right and then you know sort of you read it left to right and then the next line would be another set of pages left to right. Um, you know, the, the organization of which page points to where and where the sub pages line up in that. Uh, I mean, the, the issue of sub pages was, was uh, brought up extensively in the long site client meeting last Friday. So, uh, you know, there was, you know, there, there was a wish to make sure that, that the nesting of pages is still possible, that the, the nesting of pages and the, the, the linear flow from page to page might also be shown. I mean, that's some of that's part of what's behind this notion of a, of a course map. So I don't know if anyone who was there on Friday wants to speak to a little bit of that, or 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 I could, but I think you know now would be a good time to feed that piece of it in. Um, one one thought related to nesting of pages is, um, and we were talking to him about this reorder page that it might be nice to show the relationships of sub pages to you know parent pages here, so that you would kind of see them indented a little bit. Um, and then obviously you can indent uh, multiple levels and uh, and we had a, a question of well how many levels deep do we need to go or, or mm. should there be a limit um, so that's just a question I'd like to put out there to you guys um, maybe uh, following the sort of header flow so like h1 h2 i think it goes up to like h5 for headers in most cases um, or maybe h6 is the max uh, but i think a lot of applications limit you to five headings terry and michael say h6 h6 is, so yeah. would yeah. six levels deep be sufficient then I think that would be a, a reasonable limit to impose or possibly five levels. You know, some applications mm -hmm. don't go all the way to six, but they stop you at five. Right. Yeah. Okay, because that would definitely be helpful to know in mm -hmm. building some sort of map. We need to know if, because if we can't just have infinite pages, right. um, it's going to get really jumbled uh, and difficult to manage in this type of interface so um, and it would be good if here you could also specify which sub you know which main page the sub page attaches to so like if you wanted to move a sub page as being linked from one page to another i don't know how that would work though with the links on the on the main page uh, maybe it would just drop it at the bottom of the main page Maybe it's centric to the item that you're viewing, meaning that the page that you're viewing, it will show like, let's say the, the parents and it will show the children. And in order to see the next, let's say, if you wanted to see more children, then you would go, you know, obviously you would click into one of the children or something like that. And then it would show, you know, the references centric to that page, meaning it would show the parents for that page. You know, so think of it sort of like a window as a slider kind of thing where it's, you know, centric to the uh, potentially centric to the, you know, the one that you have highlighted, showing you the parents mm -hmm. and the children of that one. Mm -hmm. So and essentially you, you, you get to see three generations at any given point. Exactly. So you would only ever see three at any given point. And depending on, you know, if you, let's say, click a parent, then it'll kind of all the window will slide, right? Sort of, or I don't know what I don't want to I don't know what words would be the best way to describe it but 
you know, it would sort of rotate or slide, um, you know, and then show you the, obviously those, the three that are centric to the item that you just clicked, you know, the, the, the three generations to, you know, that are centric to that. This way, you don't have, you don't end up with a page that is, or you don't end up with a structure that is uh, way too hard to view. You know, it's because uh, it's only providing you with that, you know, with that same view all the time, regardless of the size of the structure. So Sean writes, what about removing the concept of subpages and simply linking from one page to the next with all the pages being equal? Um, a few folks are, are uh, responding that subpages are useful. What, you know, what, what about the value of subpages? You know, compared to this this concept of pa simply pages linking to pages. I mean, I I think it makes perfect sense to be able to say I want to move you know this item you know from this let's say if this item is a a child of you know something you want to say oh I want to move it you know I don't want it to be a child of this item no more I want it to be a child of some other item and you would move it there. Um, I, I mean, I. No, I think it would also be nice to, you know, be able to just um, outdent things. So if you decide, oh, I, this needs to be its own, you know, top level item, you could mm -hmm. move it out and exactly. it would then have its own children pages. So I, I think the terminology just needs to be agreed upon. But right. I think a page is a page is a page, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. But yeah. people need to be able to to visually, well, most of us anyway, um, need a visual cue, how, the relationship, as to the relationship of pages to each other. So there has to be some way to represent that that is meaningful. Yeah, we had talked about like this little um, line that he has here connecting these, that he would actually mm -hmm. have little lines connecting the children to show the relationship. So anything that's a sub page would be sort of indented slightly and um, linked up. I think indentation is a, a pretty familiar visual cue, and I know that won't work for accessibility, but as a visual cue, indentation certainly um, familiar enough with that that, that they right. would recognize that as, oh, yeah, okay, these are, I'm going to use the word sub pages. Um, to or the children pages to this other page. The um, the visual equivalent cue is headings. So if if the top level page is an H1 or H2, and then the second one is H3 or H4, and so on, um, I think that's an adequate non-visual cue. Um, and also, as Terry mentions, the um, size of the text being bigger for the higher level pages. Hmm. You know, one, one of the things that's fascinating about this conversation and the one on Friday is that both of them have focused um, almost exclusively on the notion of uh, nesting and subordinating pages. I'm not sure what to make of that, but as I look back at the notes from Friday, that's where most of the notes are, too. Consistent, anyway. Michael, do you want the last screen? I just wanted one that had that left column that indicated to me like a table of contents, a different representation of, of the screen we've been talking about for pages and sub pages. Am I correct here? This this thing on the left start here, which is more. Yeah, this pages. is this start here is sort of the, the top level page and then these are other pages under it. And you but, can see it actually you yeah. can probably see it better in the other screen. Let me go here. So these are or sub pages and you'll see them represented here in the table of contents. With no indentation. Yeah, yeah they're not think, indented. They're slightly even... smaller, but they're not indented. I think the indentation is very helpful on the left. You know, if you look at like a Google Sheets um, page table of contents, it indents them as headings, different heading levels in the left. Right, yeah, I think that would be really helpful to have them. Now, uh, one question that we had as we were talking with Ben is, should this table of contents be limited to the lesson or, you know, the unit that you're looking at? Or do you want to see, like, the full index over here of the whole site? 
I'd like a see more or see other pages kind of link there. I mean, I don't want to, if I'm currently viewing a particular page, um, I'd like to see just the, the table of contents for that page. I assume that those are only going to be handled based on the number of headings that the instructor is using, uh, just like it would in a Google Doc or Word Doc. But, um, you know, maybe some kind of a see more or see other lessons on the left to expand that that list of um, topics. I mean, that that uh, table of contents is visible to students too, right? That's you know possible to open up to expand up for a student. Yeah, all correct? of these wireframes are are from the instructor perspective, but certainly we would preserve a lot of the elements on the student sort of read only view, um, and the table of contents would would maybe be one of those things that you could choose to have available or not, um, you know, depending think, on whether you want it visible. I don't think the instructor should be able to choose that. I think the student should be able to choose that because it, it can be extremely helpful to have a table of contents if you're a student to jump around to different content. Yeah, yeah that's true. That could be a, an end user decision. They can turn it on or off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like that, like, like right now it looks like it has a little expand um, arrow there, so just a way for the student to expand it out. Would there be an indicator if um, prerequisites requirements were um, instituted for these pages? I don't think that Ben was thinking at all about conditional release when he did these. Right. <laughs> we mentioned it to him when we, we talked with him earlier um, after our last meeting with the group. Uh -huh. So I don't think yeah, that's been factored in at all. Then. But yeah, but clearly we need an indication of prerequisites both for the instructor and for the student. Mm -hmm. So that would definitely be something that we would need to add um, mm -hmm. in some manner. Uh, either in the table of contents or on the page or both. Probably ideally both. It definitely struck me that the, the ability to make the kind of, of a course map that would allow you to see, uh, you know, the relationships between pages and the conditional release attributes would be a nice thing. If you could see a basic one and then have an option to, uh, you know, see a more detailed course map that would show some of these additional attributes, that would be kind of neat. Uh, Michael is asking, have we finalized the decision to use the document view from CK Editor 5 versus some of the other views? I don't think that's really been decided yet. Um, we were sort of thinking that the, you know, the document view would, would probably be the default because it's most similar to um, you know, kind of what we have now with the WYSIWYG editor, but um, it's certainly open for debate. There's a lot of great commentary going on in the chat, too. Um, I assume, Josh, you're looking at that, or you guys will save this for, for your reference? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to be trying to capture some of this to the etherpads so that if anyone else has stuff that they want to add in the etherpad, you're welcome to do that as well. Oh, yes, please. And Sean just posted um, a link to a page that allows you to create a dynamic flowchart, which could be really an interesting way to go. But yeah, that's, that's actually not accessible. Kinda... Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking <laughs> on this that's page. That's definitely not accessible. Yeah, <laughs> but the accessibility me. police has struck that yeah. down. So. All right. <laughs> well, but, I mean, as, as we think about drag and drop, though, I mean, the, the key is to have, uh, you know, a capable alternative, right? I mean, so, you know, if we we're really thoughtful about, you know, the different ways to display useful information, my guess is we could find a way to see our way through this. 
I mean, if it's an alternative view, that's fine. But if that's the primary mode of interacting with it, I don't think that's, I mean, even I as a visual user can't look at this and understand what's going on with ease. <laughs> and I have to confess that Jira, if you've ever worked in the back end of Jira to set up a workflow, it's a lot like this um, simulation map that Sean shared. And I have found it very difficult to work with myself and i don't know if, you know that could just be me but developers would love it <laughs> possibly anyway i love the the look and feel that you guys are um, sharing here, I think I think it looks super clean, and um, it's a. I think we have some questions around. Mostly, it looks like the um, relationships of pages to each other in some way that is meaningful to end users. I have and to say, I sorry. No, go ahead. I have to say, I really like that everything on this page is occurring in a single unit so that you could potentially use the CK Editor Accessibility Checker to check it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can drop the links in in line with the other content um, and indent it in line with the other content and not have to worry about it being all separate units that you mess around with individually. Yeah. Um, and what are the widgets? Is that like the the questions? I'm not sure I understand what widgets are. Sorry, was that a question? Yeah, yeah, the, the question was what are widgets? Because I see you have design resources, tool links. I assume design is page layout related. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, at least. You know, what, what, that's what, what I was thinking as far as design. Design would be like some of your page layouts, right? Resources is files. Tool links would be assignments, quizzes, you know, other things you link to in the site. And widgets um, was sort of a catch-all for everything else, like the checklist that happens in lessons right now, um, maybe external apps that you pull in, that those might live under that um, section um other things like uh you know inline question or um you know other types of lesson specific functionality that might be sort of modular uh, could be a widget yeah and i don't so, think widget was the actual uh <laughs> is what it's going to be what that the title that will be used in the end i think it was just what we were sort of conceptualizing as yeah, we were calling I mean, those things widgets um, if not, there's a better name, feel free to yeah, suggest one. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I, I highly doubt that widgets will, will, I mean, I'll say it like this. I don't, I definitely don't think that widgets will be like, you know, what that says in the end. It'll be, you know, some other word that more, that, you know, better accurately describes it. It was just kind of, like I said, what Wilma was saying. It was just, it was a catch all to kind of, we didn't know what to call all the other items just yet, probably. I think, I think also what we're seeing is uh, what comes from a, the fresh eyes perspective of a designer that has not worked with Sakai before. So on the one hand, I think, you know, we we want those that that fresh perspective and we want someone to ask us questions and say, really, you know, have you not thought about this? Because maybe we're only seeing trees and not the forest. But on the other hand, I think what you get is someone who, you know, is not quite as familiar with some of the terminology that we tend to use. So it, it introduces some confusion, like the term widgets. You know, it's kind of interesting because as we think about, you know, in the accessibility framework, you know, we've been thinking about trying to get a tester who would be more familiar with Sakai so that future testing would be informed by that familiarity. And I could totally see us trying to go down that road if we could find the right UX designer, you know, someone who has done work in Sakai before and might be called upon if we like that person to do Sakai work again. But we're not we're not there with that person yet. You know, well, this is, what do what do people think part. about the trash con the trash can icon there, in that on the right hand side? <laughs> trash con, I like the way you combine those two. Oh, I, I want to go to trash con. Yeah. Tra yeah, trash con. 
<laughs> I was thinking icon and trash can, you know. So <laughs> it's like flexible. It kind of came out wrong like that. Yeah, I think it came out right. <laughs> so, so I assume that trash can icon is whatever item currently has focus. So I'd assume communications is what's currently selected, and then that icon appears. Is that? I'd actually, if that's the case, I'd like, I, it might be better to have a hover action, meaning like when you hover over communications, you'll get a uh, a floating, you know, like uh, I'll, I'll use CK editor terms here, balloon panel, right? That um, it's like a floating editor bar and, you know, it would allow you to like, you know, with a trash can icon there and whatever else you may be able to do with it, you know? Well, but what it, about the keyboard user? I mean, uh, anything anything on hover has to be keyboard as well. Yeah, I understand, and and yeah. we would need to come up with, um, you know, um, you know, accessible alternatives likely to a lot of the, um, you know, to a lot of these uh, um, kind of, you know, UI things. Yeah, I mean that's why I said I, it has focus because keyboard focus and usually mouse focus is a hover, but. Mm -hmm. I, I think the one thing is we want to kind of maintain the functionality of being able to edit that item, um, add another item above it or below it, and delete that item, kind of what's in the, the, the little item toolbars that are there now. Yep. How, yeah, however, well, that's... While we're, while we're on the subject of functionality, sorry to cut that piece of it off, but this is actually a really important question. Uh, Michael raised this a, a little while ago in the chat, maybe six minutes ago. Is the idea to preserve all lessons functionality, or are we taking this opportunity to reset? I'm curious what folks think about that. Yeah, I'm curious too, because definitely I, I saw earlier in the chat, and we may have even talked about, uh, we definitely want to keep the pre prerequisites um, functionality. Um, and there was at least one or two other things that I've lost. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to put in a plug for the survey that I sent out yesterday um, about lessons. And the, it's a really long sur survey. I, I know this. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize in advance or after the fact if you've already filled it out. Um, it was all the different uh, features that people suggested, whether it was in some of these types of meetings or also at the um, session that Jolie and I did at Open Aperio where we did the, the concept mapping. Um, so it was a really long list of things that people were kind of brainstorming that would be nice to have in lessons, but we wanted to get a sense of which of those are really the ones that people um, are motivated to have and which ones are sort of lukewarm support or maybe more of a niche feature. And also I included the existing features because there may be some existing features that people don't really use and wouldn't necessarily be, you know, too sad if they went away. Um, I do think this is an opportunity to kind of clean up the code and make it more streamlined and, um, more user friendly and some of that may involve you know getting rid of things that are not necessarily adding a lot of value so sean writes full reset with a simplified content import from existing lessons sean i, I wonder if you can can you take a second and just advocate for full reset i was talking about compatibility with existing modules so i i don't see this as replacing the lesson builder tool but being a new tool so I, I, I think we're, the, the question was more probably about feature functionality now that uh, Michael and, and Wilma have talked a bit more. I was thinking more about um, migration path, I guess, from that compatibilities perspective between the current lesson tool and lessons 2.0 tool. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, I'll just add a little stab to that, um, that uh, the we until until lessons until we had a, a really good idea of you know how lessons two was going to let's say uh you know look feel and, and you know all the function along with it we didn't want to answer the migration path right away because we didn't want we don't we didn't want people to sort of think of it like um 
that um, this all this new functionality has to replicate um, everything that's in lessons right now, right? There, there, there will be likely new things that we add, but there may be also things that, you know, likely can be, you know, just removed because, you know, they're either, you know, for whatever reason, right? And so I'm just saying that, that you know, we're just, we wanted to answer that question later. I, and I will say this though, I definitely think there will be de a definite migration path. There definitely will be for those that want to say, oh, I want to, you know, all my content from Lesson Builder to, you know, come into this new tool, like what you said, um, uh, Sean. But it would be definitely that. It would be a migration from um, the, the old tool, let's say, or the lesson, I don't even want to call it the old tool. It's the, probably the wrong word. Of migration from Lesson Builder to uh, this new Lessons tool. You know, so it's a good question, but we wanted to, it's, it's probably likely best not answered until we know what everybody wants and we have something, you know, um, um, fleshed out and, you know, a, as such. Yeah. Um. That brings up a good question about import because it doesn't look like there's any import option on this page. And I know people are using other LMSs uh, or, you know, import, they would be wanting to import from their old lessons. Um, some kind of import option would be important to include. Yeah, we, we're definitely going to keep import options um, and hopefully improve upon them a little bit. Um, that isn't reflected in these UI uh, wireframes, but um, but that is something that's kind of forefront because people need to have that kind of uh, ability to, to pull in content from different sources and to export it as well. Yeah. Uh, we are five minutes out from from our time, and uh, so we we have time for a few more comments, and uh, then we'll need to wrap up. Speaking of export, can can the I'd I'd like to see the export <clears throat> be a, able to be a little bit more granular, because right now if you export from lessons, you get the whole kit and caboodle of all your pages, mm -hmm. um, and it would be nice to you know I know I have some instructors that that they just want to export a single lessons page and its content, subsidiary content, and not everything. Yeah. And that's all I have to say about export. <laughs> Agreed, yeah, I, think, I think granularity is good, and not just yeah. for exporting, but also for copying. Um, oh, yeah got some uh, requests for you know the ability to copy a single page from another course for example stuff like that so um, definitely want to be able to satisfy those kinds of use cases Sean raises an interesting point about SCORM and uh, the potential for a tool like this to replace some of the SCORM use cases nice idea mm -hmm. it is a nice idea Mm -hmm. It's very, very relevant. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I think this is this is great. These comments from everyone have been super helpful. I'm, I'm sure to the development team, and um, we're really excited about the direction this is going. Thank you, guys, so much. So well, thanks everyone for all your input. We really appreciate it. And again, like Josh mentioned, if you have additional comments, um, feel free to put them into the Etherpad, and uh, and we'll we'll gather all that up along with the chat from today. Um, I noticed a few people were asking about the eye icon and what that does. I actually don't know. I would have to ask um, Ben what he was uh, envisioning that that would be. Certainly, publish and publish would be a reasonable explanation. Um, maybe you know hide from students. Um, kind of thing, but I don't know if that was the intended um, use, but it, it, it's certainly one that jumps to mind. Could be student preview too, Katie says. So yeah, that, that's another possibility. I just pasted the link to the survey. Oh, thank you. Feature Appreciate that. Into the chat for folks um, to make it easy for you to just jump on in there. Yep. If you've not yet filled it out, please do.
it's really long. So make sure that you have a coffee first. It is really <laughs> long. <laughs> I mean, and I wasn't really sure how to answer all of them, but I did, you know, I just took a stab. It's one of those weird surveys where, you know, actually getting all the information is actionable, but that doesn't make it a, a fun opportunity for respondents. So thank you in advance for right. taking the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, the UX call starts right after this um, at 11, two minutes from now in room three. So hopefully folks have time to join that call as well. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, we have no meeting on November 6th because we're having Sakai Virtual Conference on that day. So I'm ex super excited and looking forward to seeing sessions and all of you there. Um, November 20th, Wilma and Josh are back again. Actually, we may that. have to reschedule that oh. one. Um, <laughs> okay. I meant to tell you and I forgot. Um, oh, no but I, I don't think we're going to be able to make it that week. So. Okay. So that week's we open. <laughs> that week's open. And uh, so we're taking um, offers and suggestions for that session. Um, and we also have, well, it's possible the cloud service integration might move to one of the December slots, but we have a few open. So please, folks. And yes, we could do a Jirapalooza if nothing else. All right. Jirapalooza on November 20th. Tricia, could I ask for one of those slots or at least part of it to yeah. have a conversation about the Sakai roadmap for 2021 through 2023? Absolutely. Um, do you do you think that is a a full session kind of topic or just um a quick um order? my guess is it's probably like 30 minutes so there would be time yeah. for a couple of jiras and then a shorter yeah. conversation than this one has been okay and we are now at time and i know the ux group is starting but yes josh just send me an email if you don't mind and yep. i'll get you on the schedule we will do thank you so much okay thanks a lot bye everybody bye all Bye, thanks.